Hello and welcome to episode 458 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, how are you doing? I'm good and this week actually marked an anniversary for me and Money to the Masses. So I actually quit my job at the time that I had 10 years ago and started full time on Money to the Masses. And if people have been listening to the podcast for a number of years, they may recall that I actually produced a separate podcast called One Giant Leap, which was all about that idea of taking a leap of faith with something that you wanted to start whether it be a side hustle or a potential business you were going to create and that was inspired by my own journey of taking that leap of faith so it was great to be 10 years on and here we are Andy and how Money to Masses has grown and we've got obviously the podcast which we've had more than I think it's three and a half million downloads we've got the Money to Masses website where the articles have been read more than 37 million times of course we've got the Money to Masses team so things have changed a lot over those 10 years of course Money to Masses has been going for 14 years because I was doing it as a kind of a, a background hobby side hustle for want of a better phrase for four years and then I actually took that leap of faith so it's really a a thank you to everybody who supported me along this journey enabled it to get to where we are now and enabled me to be able to help so many people but also I think I want to say to people if you have got something that you want to try or a side hustle whatever you want to call that then do go for it don't be held back by that fear of failure because if I had have been then I would have more than likely still be doing what I was doing then I certainly wouldn't be doing what I am doing now so do take that leap of faith I'm not anybody particularly special I just did something for the passion and who knows where you may end up if you do the same and Damien I'm glad you did take that leap of faith because this year I celebrated my five-year anniversary at Money to the Masses so you're 10 years doing this full-time I'm five years doing this full-time and we've got another important milestone coming up in a few weeks to come now but the 500th episode of money to the masses and all of this has been made possible by you doing and taking that leap of faith so brilliant stuff yeah and you say that andy it's more than just a few weeks until we hit the 500th episode it's about what about 40 odd episodes time but it's only i think a few weeks and i'll double check the dates on this since we've been doing this podcast for a decade as well so i don't think it was very long I think it's a couple of months' time, but I will check the dates. One thing I do want to quickly throw out there, we had a really good review come in for the podcast. Thank you to those people who have been finding the podcast on YouTube and leaving comments. I've been responding to those. DJ Dom in the house, he left a, well, I assume it's a he, but... They left a review for the podcast on Apple saying, great financial podcast. After listening to MTTM for several years, I always found it engaging, insightful and incredibly valuable. This podcast offers a refreshing perspective on managing finances with practical tips and inspiring stories that will empower listeners to take control of their financial future. This is a must listen for anyone seeking to improve their financial literacy and make smarter money decisions. My son has taken on board Damien's general advice and now has a substantial sum invested based on low cost trackers keep up the great work we will keep listening and learning so that is a great review if that's you dj dom then do send me an email damien at money to the masses.com to claim that review and i will send you a money to the masses mug you can join the pile that i've got to still send out so thank you for that review i'm going to move straight on to what's on this week's podcast i've been talking long enough three pieces as usual the first piece is going to be an investment piece and This is going to interest, actually, Dom, because it does relate to funds that are consistent over a period of time. So it's based upon a piece of research for 8020 investor members. But there is some interesting insight into the world of index trackers. The other piece I'm going to do, where I'm going to finish the podcast with this, is about car insurance. So I recently renewed my car insurance. But there were three things, really, I wanted to point out to people to be aware of when you are comparing products. You go online, you use a price comparison site something to be mindful of as well as a few other tips and Andy you're going to be doing a piece on I'm going to be talking about deep banking explaining exactly what it is and how it could happen to you and what you can do if it happens to you 
So interesting, if you don't know what debanking is, then make sure you listen out for that piece. So I'm going to jump straight on to the investment research that I carried out for 8020 Investor. Now, 8020 Investor, there's lots of different types of research that I do on there. It could be I'm looking for funds that do particularly well in a certain environment. Maybe it's an inflationary one. Maybe it's something in relation to a particular asset class like gold. And there is obviously a focus on momentum as well. So it's benefiting from current trends in investment markets that are unfolding. And there's obviously lots of evidence that shows momentum investing is one of the key styles of investing that have proven successful over time. And the other two in particular are smaller cap investing, so investing in smaller companies that eventually become bigger ones, and value investing, where you invest in things that are undervalued by the market on the hope, assumption that they will actually regain their true value and therefore you make money on the way up. But other things I do sometimes look at is there are ways of investing and having a portfolio. And one of them is to have a core portfolio. So you have a core to your investments. It could be a fund or a series of funds where you may have a stable portion of your money and then you may have a more satellite approach around the outside so you may have some funds that you might use to try and boost your overall return over time and that could have something like maybe a little bit higher risk but in the middle you have something that's a bit more core that's a bit more balanced and what I've done is done different pieces of research looking at funds that you could hold for the longer term now that's not to say that you should but just exploring the concept of well is there any element of consistency out there within fund management, be they active funds or trackers. So what I've done is looked at every fund that's out there. And this time around, I even included investment trust. So usually I'll focus on unit trust, but I looked at investment trust too. So this is looking at over 3000 funds and looking at each of them in their respective sectors. So if I'm talking about Japanese equities, I'm looking at how they fare against their peers in the same space. Whether it's bonds, I'm looking at how they fare against their peers from the same sector. And what I was looking for is, it is a way of looking at performance, different statistics around performance to see if there are any funds that have generally been very consistent in terms of performance. Because what you may find is a fund will do particularly well in a given environment, but then it could actually be tomorrow's lag and actually be at the bottom of the performance tables. So you've got this kind of whipsawing and that kind of happens a lot. So most funds will have their day and then they'll have a period of underperformance. But are there some that are generally strong performers over periods of time? Now, evidence suggests that most active funds, so when we say active funds, they're funds that are run by a manager. So that manager or their team will be picking and choosing the underlying companies or assets to invest in. So if it's a UK all company fund, then they'll be picking all the different types of company in the UK and may pull together 50 to 100 of those into a portfolio which people can invest in. That's the fund. And they have a mandate which they adhere to when they're running that particular fund. Now, it's been shown that around about 90% of those funds tend to underperform the market over the longer term. So that is one of the stats you normally hear trotted out as reasons to invest in trackers. Now, of course, like I've mentioned already, every dog has its day. So there'll be periods where trackers underperform and that's when markets turn lower. We've had periods actually recently where active funds have on the whole fared better than history versus their tracker peers. And that was particularly like during, say, 2022 and some of 2020. 23, where they had a real focus on particular areas. And of course, where we had AI stocks going through the roof and they were overexposed to those in their active funds, then they obviously outperformed some of the trackers. That's an aside. So what I wanted to do was look at, could we come up with an idea or a way of judging performance over a period of time consistency? Now, the reason I'm going to talk through it because this is how my brain works and it may be inspire the people to carry out their own research or how you could pick funds that have been consistent. Now, the thing is, if you just pick one time frame, let's say I want to look at a fund that how it performed over the last five years. Now, that doesn't give you a consistency. That just tells you that, let's say, a fund in the UK equity space had outperformed all of its peers on average, so it's above the average in that sector, that it done well over that period of time. But it doesn't tell you how it actually performed during that period. So when I looked at this, I wanted to try and bake in some form of consistency. And the way I did that is to look at performance over one year, three year, five year and 10 years. So for every fund out there, I looked at how it performed versus its peer group, so the sector average. And if it outperformed, then obviously that was a tick in the box. Now, to be consistent, 
the criteria that I gave was that it had to outperform its sector average in each of those time frames, so one, three, five, and 10 years. But then I wanted to take it a little bit further. So I actually looked at some statistics that relate to performance and the way a fund is managed. So one of them is alpha. If you listen to this show for a while, you might have heard me talk about alpha. And really, that gives you a, a measure of the manager's apparent skill at picking winning investments versus their benchmark. So all you've got to realize is the higher that number, the better. So you can get that alpha number. It's not often put on the fund fact sheets, but sometimes you can find it on uh, websites like Morningstar or Trustnet if you want to go and find them. But I screened all of them and looked at their alpha. So I therefore looked at funds that had an alpha over the last three years that was significantly better than their sector average. So it was above the average of its peer group. And I also looked at something called Sharp Ratio. Now, people who listen to the podcast might realize I'm a little bit of a fan of the Sharp Ratio. It is a statistic that indicates how much extra return a fund manager gets for the risk that they're taking. So for the increased risk a fund manager takes, you would want them to give you extra return. Because the reason why it's an interesting statistic, if you think about it, you could have two funds that had performed the same over a given period, let's say it's five years, but one of them had been taking much more risk. So they've been investing in, say, equities exclusively, where another fund from the same sector may have had exposure to bonds in there. So let's say it's one of the mixed multi-asset sectors. And so just because a fund has the same performance, you'd think the one that took less risk had actually done better. So they're actually managing that risk and they had achieved the same as somebody who was being slightly reckless. And the analogy you want to think of is they got you to the same destination if they were a taxi driver without crashing the car or doing something crazy driving through red lights. That's what the person who was 100% equities was doing. The fact that you ended up with a pretty decent outcome was partly because of what was going on in the market. So you always want somebody who manages risks because if there'd been a downturn, you know the one that had been exclusively in equities would have underperformed the one that had a bit more of a diversified portfolio. And the other stat I looked at was drawdown. Now drawdown is a stat you don't tend to find, but you can see it if you look at charts. So maximum drawdown, say over the three year period, you can see what was the biggest movement from a peak to a trough. So when markets sold off, for example, what was the biggest fall? And you want to try and minimize those. So I filtered out the ones that had a very large drawdown. So that was showing that they were the funds that weren't consistent, they were more volatile. So that, in a way, you could look at a volatility measure if you're doing this in your own way. So the point of what I'm getting to, you can start to create consistency by measuring not only certain key statistics that are quoted out there, and you can find them on Morningstar and Trustnet. They are alpha and uh, sharp ratios. There are others as well. You could look at volatility that gives you a, an indication of how much you get that wobble up and down. The other thing, you should look at performance over different time frames. And of course, as you move through different investment cycles, then funds will drop in and out of this sort of shortlist that I produce based on what's been going on. But over that one, three, five, 10 year period, you've covered quite a few key events and some black swan style events as well, like the pandemic. The thing I wanted to highlight for the podcast, because I'm not going to tell you what's in the list, because that would be unfair to people who actually subscribe to 8020 Investor. But I want to give you some insight, because there were actually 11 funds that made the shortlist, which is a, a very short shortlist, given that there were a few thousand funds in the analysis. And actually, five out of the 11 were passive, they were tracking funds. So that shows you going back to that stat I mentioned earlier about how active funds don't tend to outperform over the long term. But there were six that did in their respective sectors. And so there were a range of sectors that actually threw up a consistent fund based on my criteria. There were a few global funds. There was a Japanese equity fund, a North American equity fund. There was an investment trust actually that popped out and a European equity fund as well. And there was also a multi-asset fund that came out. But the one I want to throw out there is just one fund. This is not a recommendation in any way, shape or form. It's it's just telling you that based on the criteria that I'd used, this fund came out and it was a tracker fund that actually probably a lot of people who listen to the podcast might actually know. And it's the Vanguard FTSE Developed World X UK Equity Index. So that is a fund that is obviously widely available. It's probably very popular, but it just shows that you can end up investing in a tracker fund, a well diversified one over a period of time. And actually it can produce a more consistent return 
even though it's closely tracking what's going on in markets than some of those actively managed funds. As I mentioned, it's not a recommendation, but it's something that's quite interesting to look at. And if you are going to look at that global equity sector, then something like that you could use as a benchmark for that measure of consistency. If you're going to map it perhaps against other funds that you have within your portfolio or you're looking at. Okay, so moving on to the next piece then. I'm going to be talking about debanking, which essentially refers to the unwanted closure of a bank account. Now, complaints to the Financial Ombudsman Service, the FOS, about debanking have increased by around about 44% in the last year, and a higher percentage of those complaints are being upheld. So I thought this was a good piece to look into a bit more and provide some details on the pod, because obviously if complaints are rising, there may well be some listeners out there that have experienced this or are worried about experiencing this. So there has been a growing concern that banks are closing bank accounts unfairly and it's been in the spotlight really ever since Nigel Farage if you remember last summer he was famously debanked by the private bank Coots. So in terms of the rules banks should generally give two months notice if they deem it necessary to close a bank account but this could rise up to 90 days under new rules being proposed by the government. Now the rules are slightly different in cases of suspected fraud obviously the bank would need to act quickly in that regard and if that happens to you and obviously if that happens to you then that could leave you stranded and without access to your money. Now financial crime isn't the only reason why a bank account might be closed by your bank. There are other reasons including things like account inactivity. So if you haven't used your bank account for a significant period of time that is obviously a cost to the bank and they may decide to close down your account. And other reasons include incomplete account information. So let's say they do some due diligence on your account and they realize that the information that they hold on file isn't correct or isn't complete. And there are other commercial reasons why a bank might decide to close down your bank account. Now the Treasury Committee has said that it's looking closely at the issue of debanking at the moment because it has seriously impacted small and medium-sized businesses particularly in the last year and the vast majority of these debanking complaints that have been received by the FOS are down to current account issues. In fact 2,720 of the 3,858 cases are down to current accounts so it's not old accounts it's not old savings accounts that we're talking about here they are the accounts that either individuals or businesses are using for day-to-day banking so interestingly Andy you actually say the numbers have been going up so why is that yeah so banks have always had a legal and regulatory obligation to prevent accounts from being used for criminal purposes such as money laundering that's always been the case but in October this year October 2024 it's a key date really because there's going to be a new mandatory requirement for the banks to reimburse people it's a mandatory reimbursement scheme for particular types of fraud and that fraud is authorized push payment it's app fraud we've covered it before on the podcast so in an effort to ensure that banks aren't paying out and to sort of stop this crime happening in the first place it seems likely that banks are going to be acting quickly to shut down this activity to ensure that that fraud doesn't take place at a larger scale yeah and for people who don't know what app fraud is that authorized push payment fraud it's the type of fraud or scam where people are tricked into sending payment to someone who isn't who they claim to be so it was something that had been increasing over time and there'd been checks and things that they were trying to put in place to try and stop it when you make payments to people but there's obviously a real positive that this legislation and change is coming in but then as you say Andy banks are now trying to preempt that by closing accounts and and debanking it's interesting because you say about bank accounts but people do need to be mindful of credit cards as well because obviously there are things like credit cards where they can be shut down uh, after a period of inactivity so if you want to keep them open and I've, I've gone off piece a little bit here but if you have a credit utilization that is low so let's say you only use about 10% of your possible credit limit across all your cards and that's obviously a positive so generally speaking it depends where you look but they say keeping it below 25 percent is good for your credit report and any credit scoring that that occurs when you apply for loans but of course if a credit card company decides to close your card then that would bring up your credit utilization and what they do is they will write to you to say if you don't use the card typically within a period of time they will close it so that's why you can't ignore any letters or anything from your banks whether it's your current account or if it's due credit cards even if you're not using them because there is this obviously issue of being debanked so to finish up this piece then andy what can people do if they're under the threat of being debanked 
yeah, so I just wanted to point out that it is exceptionally rare that you would be debanked without any notice at all. That generally only happens in what they would say in exceptional circumstances. Obviously, if the bank feels that there is suspected fraud happening with that particular account. But if it does happen to you, the first thing that you should do is make alternative arrangements if possible. So check what's happened to the money in your bank account. Speak to your bank provider. Banks will handle this side of things differently. So it's important to understand understand where that money is, where it's gone, and how and when you can get access to that. Do make a list if you can get access to your bank account, or again, speak to them of all the direct debits that are due to go out because it's likely that they'll get rejected. So then you can have the relevant details to contact those parties and make them aware and make alternative arrangements if possible. The next thing you should do is make sure that you complain in writing to your bank provider. If you're not happy with its response, or if it hasn't been responded to within the eight weeks that's required you can then go to the financial ombudsman service the fos and take things further another thing you must do is get in touch with cfas so that's c-i-f-a-s it's a not-for-profit organization that can help protect you or your organization if it's your business bank suffering from different types of fraud and you can access a national fraud database and you'll need to make what's called a subject data access request to check for specific markers on your file. Now, these markers aren't often visible on your credit report. So this is the stage that you need to go to to ensure that your credit file ultimately doesn't get wrecked. You do need to be careful again then with future applications for new bank accounts that you make. Again, because if there's a CFAS marker on your account that has detected some fraudulent activity, it isn't going to necessarily going to appear on your credit report. And the problem you have is because it's not showing up on your credit report, the provider that you're applying to will have access to the CFAS information and so may well reject your application based on that information. And then the rejected application will then have knock-on effects on your credit report. So you could end up unwittingly wrecking your own credit report through not going through the correct steps. Yeah, and just to add on that, Andy, CFAS generally is a, is a positive thing because it is there to stop fraud. If people go back and listen to the podcast episode that we did a few years ago now where somebody stole a whole load of money from me and my children via banking fraud, I actually applied to CFAS and made the bank actually pay for it to put a marker on my account. So it makes it more difficult when you apply for credit. They make further checks. So it is a positive thing if you've been a victim of fraud because it means that people are less likely to be able to open up accounts and things in your name or apply for credit without further checks. So for you, Andy, what you're saying there, that will naturally occur. And if you're not aware of it for some reason, then that could cause you a slight issue. Yeah, and absolutely. And and exactly on that point, Damien, the final step of this is you'll obviously need to open a new bank account. And if you do have that CFAS marker on your account, then just speak to the relevant provider that you're hoping to apply to before making that application and speak to a human there. Explain what's happened. And depending on the provider, you may find that they're more lenient in your situation. They may be able to provide you an account with certain restrictions, such as an account with no overdraft facility, so that you can still carry out your bank banking activities without being unnecessarily burdened by any potential future fraud. And there may also be an option where you can take out an account which is prepaid so you can put money into that account and then load up that account with your direct debits and carry on banking in that way. And one tip is it is generally a good idea to have more than one current account because if something happens on one of them, it gets closed for whatever reason or frozen, then you have another means to be able to bank and you would be able to put new direct debits, etc., on that other bank account if you need be. So it gives you that ability to still be able to bank if you have a second current account. So don't just close old accounts if you're not using them because at the moment where banking is generally free in the UK, so you're not paying a fee for your bank account, then it doesn't cost you anything to actually have that bank account open. Okay, so let's finish off this podcast with the final piece then. Damien, you've been shopping around for car insurance and you've noticed some, well, some quirks to the system, just things that listeners should be aware of. Yeah, so obviously I run this podcast. We write lots about car insurance and about how to shop around. So every year my car insurance renewal comes in and then I look at it and inevitably it always seems to go up despite the fact I don't make a claim and you just start to shop around to see if you can get a better deal. Now, 
obviously I always pay annually for car insurance because it's cheaper to pay annually than it is to pay monthly. So if you can afford it, one way to save money is to pay annually. Now, I'll give you some general tips that we, we, we always abide by just to run through them, just to give a bit of completeness to this piece of the podcast. So obviously, the main thing you've got to do is shop around. So that means looking at price comparison sites. Yes, there are some major providers like Direct Line that aren't appearing on those sites. You could contact them. But the main thing is don't just accept your renewal quote. Do compare with other providers out there. I want to come back to this though, because this is where there are a few nuances in how you use a price comparison site that could get you a better deal or make sure you get the deal that you think you're getting. Obviously, you want to be a careful driver that brings your premiums down and obviously your no claims discount is important. We did a piece on whether to protect your no claims discount recently on the podcast. We'll put a link to that in the show notes so you can listen to that episode. Obviously, it depends on the car that you've got, where you live. There's various factors that go into what your car insurance premium actually will be. And funnily enough, one of them is which car insurance group they appear in. So generally, there are cars that are cheaper to insure than others. We'll put a link in the notes of the show to a list of the cheapest car groups for different ages actually we just updated it i could go through them on the podcast but it would be quite long-winded but let's just say if you're looking at the cheapest groups then the chevrolet spark a fiat panda a skoda fabia hatchback they're among the cheapest they're in the cheapest car insurance group i should say um if you're looking for the next group up you're looking at things like a, a kia picanto a volkswagen up that's the next cheapest group you're going to get so obviously Depending on the car, it's going to have an impact on how much you're going to pay. So I say there's a there's a link to the different groups, but they are the two cheapest groups and there's some examples. But when you're looking at your car insurance, so going back to what my experience was, obviously car insurance went up. I'm sitting there looking at it and thinking, I don't really want to pay as much as they're trying to quote me. So there are different levers you can obviously pull. Now, in my instance, I had to increase my mileage because my daughter plays football and she plays at a pretty decent level. I have to travel all around the country with her when she's playing football. So my mileage on my car has gone up this year. So it's going to be going up next year. In particular, that's the key thing. I'm going to have to be driving more than I had previously. So my mileage was low always historically, but now it's going to be going up as we go into the new season. And so I had to increase my mileage. Now, the general tip is, the lower your mileage, the lower your insurance premium should be. But of course, I had the opposite because I was going to have to put it up. Now, the thing is, I've seen some stuff on social media, which I think is horrendous, where people are giving tips. Um, I'm going to be doing more on social media and pulling out some of the stuff that I think is really wrong and misleading. There was one guy on there I saw who was telling people, tell them you'll do less miles than you do and that'll bring your insurance premium down. Well, that's fraud actually and the thing is if you go on to the .gov website you can check for any car's own MOT history so if you want to buy a car you can go on there put the reg in and you can see if it's got an MOT certificate the thing you can also see is check its mileage history through the years so if I can check your car mileage you know the insurer is going to be able to check your car mileage so lying about how much mileage you do in your car is going to ultimately invalidate your insurance because when if you have a crash don't forget the more mileage you do the greater the risk so that is something that i think is a very bad idea the other one coincidentally they did mention on this social media video was to add a name driver who was older than you so somebody who would therefore lower your premium and you could be the secondary driver on that car and get a lower premium well that's actually called fronting and that again is fraud so you're not allowed to do that and again that will invalidate your insurance so i think over the next year, I'm going to end up doing a quite a bit on social media, pointing out some of these things that people, I mean, some of this stuff is getting like 50,000 likes. It's baffling to me. And they're actually misleading people and will cause people to commit fraud. So when you're comparing car insurance with different comparison sites, it is best to use multiple ones because then you cover the whole market because not all insurers will appear on every comparison site. But broadly speaking, they do have most of the market on each of them. But the reality is that the results you get do vary. They're not all identical in terms of premium you'll notice there are nuances there are differences now one thing i did notice that if you obviously want to set your excess there is always going to be what you have as a voluntary excess let's say it's a hundred pound but there will be a compulsory excess that the insurer is putting in as well so if you make a claim you've got to pay basically both of those in the case of a 250 pound compulsory and a hundred pound voluntary that would be 350 total almost always it seems the cheapest ones at the top are the ones that have the highest compulsory excess 
this and I saw such a wide range, the widest I'd seen in all the years I've been doing it, where I wanted to have very low levels of excess in total, including the voluntary plus the compulsory. Yet when the cheapest insurers were almost giving me a thousand pounds in total excess, I'd have to pay, despite the fact I'd only put in, say, a hundred or 200 pound voluntary. So therefore they are the cheapest, but if I'd made a claim, I'd have had to pay something like 700 to 800 pounds of the claim first. So you're not comparing apples with apples. Make sure you look at the total excess you're going to pay and compare that to what you've got on your renewal documents. The other thing that I then noticed was I thought, well, I'd like to see if I can get some cash back. So if you look around on car insurance for cash back, there are very few deals that exist out there. One of the places that will quickly come up if you do a Google search is Money Supermarket. So Money Supermarket say that they offer cash back on the comparison of car insurance. The thing is, you need to compare the total deal that you get once you get the cash back versus what you can get in other places. So in my example, I actually looked at what the product I would get in the event I did it on Money Supermarket and would get that cash back. And it looked a very good deal. But then I looked at another insurance company, sorry, I should say a comparison company. So in this case, it was confused.com. I did a search and yes, the premium that came back, it looked like the same product would mean that if I bought it with the Money Supermarket link, I would get the £25 cash back and it would be cheaper. But then I looked closely and if you looked at the nuances, one of them had windscreen cover and one didn't. The Confused.com version did have windscreen cover. And when I looked into it, the cover that I was going to get via Confused.com was, let's say it was going to be £450, was actually their top tier, their highest level of cover. The cover I was going to get via the Money Supermarket link was actually their mid tier. So I wasn't going to get windscreen cover and I wanted windscreen cover but in any event if you bought the mid-tier one by money supermarket yes you would have got cash back but overall what happened if you looked at the confused.com version i got a better deal even after the cashback route on the other one with a better product as well i got the higher level of cover so this is something that i hadn't seen before that you're getting different things being shown by different providers and whether that's all part of the various cashback deals or whatever so what you need to do is if you get a result on a comparison site for your car insurance on one comparison site and you think you're comparing it to the same product but on a different comparison site go through to the insurer check that they're the same level of cover and the same product because there's a very good chance they might not be and so the cheaper one that you're seeing or the one that actually in my instance they were very similar price one comparison site was giving me a, an inferior product presumably the other site which was giving me the top tier for the same price had a better deal discounted rates but it wasn't evident that was the case so make sure you check around also if you look at the various different comparison sites some of them give you ratings so de facto on confused.com and de facto is quite a good rating system you can look at it and you can see whether it's going to be a good product based on one to five stars and that's based on de facto rating so that can help you do research even if the best deal is on a different price comparison site so the message from this part of the podcast is make sure you do shop around, make sure you do follow the tips. I'll put a link to the article in the notes of this particular show so you can read them at your own leisure. But make sure when you use the comparison sites that you do compare them and you make sure you're getting the very best deal because sometimes when you look at it, the results are a little bit misleading and they're trying to get you to buy a product that could be not only inferior but it appears cheap, that you could get a better product even cheaper elsewhere. Yeah, and I suppose the final point on that, Damien, is once you've got that final price, you can actually still go back to your existing insurer and give them a final chance to beat that quote because they're happy to have that conversation. That's not to say that they will be able to beat it, but at least they can try. Yeah, and the other final thing I'll just say on there, of course, some of the different comparison sites do give you rewards and deals, say two for one cinema tickets. All those things have got to be baked into the round if you're a regular cinema goer but for most people i think when you've got to really focus on is the product and the cost so andy that's it for this week isn't it yeah that's it we're all done don't forget to check out our podcast page it is money to the masses.com forward slash podcast and we've got a list of all of our deals on there every way that you can help out the money to the masses podcast again we do love it if you can please review the podcast in the relevant places wherever you download your podcast at five stars would be fantastic and we may well read you 
you out on a future podcast and you may get a money to the masses mug don't forget our socials please do interact damien is very very active on instagram and also our youtube channel as well just search for money to the masses in youtube and subscribe to our channel Yep, and just to clarify for a few people who seemed a little confused when I was reading the YouTube comments last week, but the video version of the podcast or snippets of them do go out uh, later the following week because obviously we do this towards the end of the week when we record the show. We can't get it edited at the moment before the audio version goes out on the Sunday, so we tend to put out either the full show or snippets on our socials during the following week, so do keep an eye out. And so that's it. We're done for this week. Until next time. Until next time. Oh.